Hello, internets. This is Adam Brinkerhoff coming to you from Space United headquarters in Colorado. I am here with our executive director, uh, relatively fresh back from vacation in Ireland, Troy Dunn. Say whatever well, you want, Troy. Whatever I want. Well, this is really just going down the same path that it always does, unfortunately, for the viewing audience. Um, so today we are back after about a month uh, of... Uh, sabbatical? I don't know. Uh, Troy went to Ireland, I went to Hawaii, and we are back and fresh and ready to talk about space exploration yet again. Uh, today's topic is how to explore space without a college degree. So for all of you youths out there um, and uh, adults without a college degree or maybe without uh, a technical degree thinking, well, how do I get involved in space exploration? Uh, we're here to give you a couple ideas as well as to talk about a really awesome guest um, who works with uh, college students every day. So uh, let's jump right into it, Troy. So first off, um, there's this really cool uh, software package called Satellite Toolkit. It is made by an organization called uh, Analytic, Analytical uh, Graphics Incorporated. And uh, it is a uh, software module that allows you to uh, basically build uh, satellites and orbits uh, either around the Earth or around uh, other bodies. Um, you can do stuff with um, telecommunications um, or imagery or all sorts of different things. And uh, as you can see here, they have a free version of their software that you can download uh, without getting any sort of extra permissions or anything like that. Plus, if you're uh, in the education world, uh, you can also get additional modules. Uh, they have all sorts of extra tools that they have on top of the free version uh, that allow you to do um, even more cool stuff. So check out the free version, see what you think. If there are things that you want to do that uh, are not included in the free version, then um, get in touch with the tech support at AGI and, and see if they can hook you up. But it's a cool way to get a, a new perspective on how space um, works and how satellites orbit around the Earth. Uh, as you can see in the picture to the right, uh, you can show the measurement of uh, different um, hardware on board as well as uh, the solar arrays and uh, the Earth down below. You can also um, focus in on one satellite but then see how it flies with respect to other satellites. So you see on that screenshot a couple of GPS satellites and uh, they have a huge database of all the satellites that are actually up in the sky. So it's not just... Um, things that you might make up, but it's actually looking at things that are um, up there doing um, work on a day-to-day -day basis uh, that you can understand better by uh, learning using this uh, module. So check that out and let us know what you think, um, and we'll uh, let AGI know as one of our uh, sponsors um, and uh, improve the software over time. All right, Troy, uh, tell us about some events. Well, uh, other ways that you can get involved with space exploration if you don't yet have a college degree or your degree maybe isn't in an, an area that uh, has a clear fit with space exploration would would be to tend to attend events and, and get involved with organizations and um, one of the organizations that's out there is uh, best uh, which is a robotics competition uh, a year or two ago they they worked on a, a project for uh, younger students, uh, I believe it was um, elementary, middle school, that could get involved and they, they worked on building a robot that would kind of simulate how a, a space elevator would work and so it gave students an, an opportunity to take a look at space exploration and, and how they might get involved um, you know early on. Uh, there's other uh, organizations out there that also put on events. The Space Symposium is coming up uh, next week down in Colorado Springs that's being put on by the Space Foundation and that's an international uh, symposium. Uh, that is basically has uh, everybody in the space industry come down and, and show off uh, you know their newest gadgets and, and what they're working on it's a great way to, to talk to uh, engineers and space experts from NASA to JAXA to SpaceX um, United Launch Alliance I mean everybody is there uh, and then of course there's space ups that uh, you know we put on one last year uh, and there's space ups going on all over the world that, that allow uh, really anybody uh, with or without a degree to uh, talk about space exploration and, and look at different ways to get involved. 
All right. Um, so going back to our slides, uh, the next topic we have uh, in this general uh, discussion is your pilot's license. So um, we're going to get more into that with our guest Tanya uh, in a minute. But um, as you may know, um, that uh, you can get a pilot's license um, through classes at your local airport, um, either through a college course or um, otherwise. And um, a lot of, as you probably know, a lot of astronauts started as pilots, um, either amateur pilots or in the uh, military, and, uh, and now look, obviously, what they were able to accomplish. So it's a great way um, to get an idea of, of the engineering and, and the experience of um, being in flight and, um, uh, and also uh, just understanding um, how, what the Earth looks like below you, and, and then you can project that uh, up into um, space uh, and, and get an idea from, from what it might look like um, up above the Earth in something like the ISS or, or something along those lines. Um, so check that out. Uh, as you can see, the, the FAA or the Federal Aviation Administration has uh, tools online uh, in terms of how to become a pilot, uh, what steps you need to take and what tests and, and those sorts of things, what training, what, how many hours you need to put in, all that good stuff. Um, but if you just contact your local airport, um, you may know of your um, big international airport. So for us here in the Denver area, that's DIA. Um, but there are also a lot of other small airports that are um, designed specifically for uh, amateur pilots or um, just for hobbyists, that sort of thing. And they have a lot um, less in terms of traffic and those sorts of things. So that might be a, a good uh, resource as well. Um, and really quickly, uh, Troy, would you just talk a little bit about our Explorer Lab um, mission and, and what's coming up in the next couple months? <clears throat> Absolutely. If I can um, just pigtail on the pilot uh, uh, license conversation there, though, is um, that you don't have to be a, a pilot to um, enjoy a flight that is um, that uh, is related to space exploration, and and uh, anybody uh, that wants to could book a flight on something like the um, zero gravity airplane uh, that uh, doesn't actually uh, hit zero gravity. It's free fall, but you get to experience uh, weightlessness and and the effects of what it would feel like to be in space, and and that's available to anybody. Doesn't require you to get a pilot's license. You simply need to buy a ticket and go through some training. So uh, another kind of um, uh, entry-level way to get people uh, involved with space exploration. But uh, one of the best ways, I think, is to get a Space United Explorer Lab. Uh, and as Adam mentioned, uh, Explorer Lab is one of the missions that uh, we're working on at Space United. Uh, and essentially, an Explorer Lab is a rocket-shaped payload carrier uh, that anybody can purchase, uh, and you can put uh, an experiment inside of the payload carrier, and then we'll launch it on a high-altitude weather balloon and return it back to you so that you can see the effects uh, at the edge of space on your experiment. Uh, it's a really low-cost, uh, easy way for anybody to get involved. You don't have to be a student. You don't have to have a degree. Uh, all you have to do is go to our website, spaceunited.org, uh, read about it, and uh, purchase one. And one more thing, uh, just to add on to that, uh, that I talked with one of our volunteers today about is uh, using the SDK um, software. Uh, we we are working on the ability to model um, one of these Explorer Lab flights via the high altitude weather balloon um, as a promotional tool as we prepare for um, some fundraising coming up. Uh, but also, um, we're also looking at that for the sake of um, our customers and our scientists, if you will, uh, who put their experiments on the Explorer Lab. So we will not only return uh, your Explorer Lab to you, but we'll also return some really cool data, either um, in a package uh, through the mail or uh, in on a server that you can access with a password uh, online uh, via the cloud. And so uh, what we're looking at is not only being able to show you um, photographs and video from the flight, uh, but also the trajectory that the um, spacecraft takes, and then um, long term our hope is to use uh, the SDK software to be able to model it um, so that you can see in SDK what um, uh, what your Explorer Lab did in terms of uh, its flight uh, over time and, and uh, space. So uh, really quickly, I'm just going to fly through these, um, but these are very important. These are our sponsors, and there are only a few of them, uh, but they are our top sponsors, so they get special billing. 
Um, I already mentioned AGI. Um, they have already supported us through their uh, free software, and uh, we have an application pending uh, for some additional modules as a nonprofit. Um, so we're looking forward to expanding our work with them. Um, Metro State has done so much good work for us in the past, and um, right now, frankly, uh, thanks to Tanya's appearance on our show in a minute. Um, so we'll talk about them more in a, in a second. But then also, uh, Troy mentioned the um, Space Symposium. Um, it used to be the National Space Symposium, but they dropped the national because it's gone international. Uh, as uh, Troy mentioned, JAXA, uh, the Japanese Space Agency, uh, kind of similar to our NASA here in the States, uh, will be there as well as many, many other uh, international groups. And so uh, it really is a, a worldwide event that brings together all the top um, companies around the world in that industry. Um, so if you can attend that next week, um, uh, take advantage of it. If not, uh, keep involved with uh, the Space Foundation and the tons of educational projects that they have going on um, throughout the year. And then finally, Uingu, uh, you may have seen them in the news a few weeks back. Uh, they are uh, doing this really cool effort uh, to name the universe, basically. They started with exoplanets, and most recently they published uh, a map of craters on Mars, and uh, they are allowing people to, to pay to um, name a crater, and it's not just um, to make them rich, but instead it's um, to fund other science initiatives. So they are taking the funds from those sales uh, and applying it uh, to various organizations that apply for grants, including our own. And um, in the process, you get to name something that uh, will be used in the future by a growing number of organizations uh, that are dedicated uh, to exploring Mars and, and other parts of the universe, uh, such as Mars One. Um, so without any further ado, we're going to hop over um, to our guest of the day, uh, Tanya Gatlin. Um, Tanya is both a professor as well as uh, a flight coach at Metro State University here in Denver. Uh, so Tanya, welcome to the show. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, how are you guys doing? Good. So um, we have lots to talk about, but in general, the, the theme of the day is um, space exploration without a college degree, and, and that obviously applies to uh, your students who have yet to graduate. Um, so my first question is um, uh, looking um, into sort of the, the students and their experiences uh, that you get to see every day. Uh, what's your favorite way to explore space? Is it in the classroom? Is it um, on the runway as a, as a flight team coach? What, what really uh, uh, gets you going? Um, I would definitely say all of the above. Um, I love educating and inspiring the younger generation towards aviation or aerospace, but my heart is also in an airplane, and I love flying, and I just love being in the air. Um, coaching the flight team is amazing. I am also the faculty advisor for a few different student groups within our department. One being, um, well, actually there's three that are um, involved specifically with aerospace, and one is the STK group, which you've already mentioned and defined. The other one is our SEDS, our Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. And then our newest group that we have, which I help oversee, is a student group that's affiliated with Commercial Space Flight Federation, CSF. And we are one of the only universities in the nation to belong to that group. And we have students that are actually partnering with industry, large industry, as well as the FAA to help come up with regulations for the new private and commercial space industry. Wow, that's uh, a lot going on. That's, that's great. Um, so then taking us back um, uh, to your past, um, how did you get involved with uh, space exploration? Did it start with um, being a pilot? Did it start with... Uh, taking a class, what what was the beginning for you? You know, I have always been aviation and aerospace, even from a child. Um, I grew up with a father who was a pilot, and he taught me how to fly as a teenager. I had my pilot's license before I had my driver's license. Um, I went to see the movie Space Camp as a junior hire when it <laughs> first came out, and when I saw that movie, I decided I wanted to be an astronaut. 
And I pushed hard to get into a military academy to try and achieve that dream. And I got appointments to both Annapolis and the Air Force Academy and went to the Air Force Academy. Um, different things in life ha happened and sidetracked me, um, and I didn't end up graduating from the Air Force Academy. But years later, I did move to Houston and um, found a job working at Johnson Space Center as an instructor of the astronauts in shuttle communications and just absolutely loved it and was so thrilled to be back in the environment again and back where I always wanted to be. Well, that's fascinating. and I think that's a testament to the idea and the reality that, I mean, um, people come from all different sort of backgrounds and um, some take the traditional routes or what you might consider to be the traditional routes to get to space exploration, but um, even when you get sidetracked uh, or end up doing, um, I don't know, different uh, paths that you initially intend to, that you can end right back up to uh, where you wanted to be in the first place. Uh, and that's just a, a testament to the perseverance as well and, and knowing what you want and, and having that passion. Um, I have one more uh, question for Tanya, but before I get to that, Troy, would you like to jump in with anything? Yeah, absolutely, Tanya. I know that you have a, a love that you've mentioned already for, for aviation and aerospace, and uh, I know that that extends to uh, a lot of different areas um, in education outside of just the, working with the university. And if I'm not, not mistaken, you have a, uh, a race coming up here pretty soon? <laughs> yes. I leave here within two weeks, and I'll be flying the Women's Air Race Classic, and it's a all-female race which basically extends across, it happens every June and the race route is different every year. This year it starts in California and it ends in Pennsylvania and there are 50 teams competing and the history of the race dates all the way back to the 1920s. Amelia Earhart was one of the founders and it was originally known as the Powder Puff Derby. <laughs> And uh, and how can people get involved uh, with that or or if oh my goodness there's multiple ways not only as a competitor if you're a female but even if you're a pilot but even if you don't compete in the race there's multiple volunteer positions you can come out to local airports where we land which are designated along the route and help um, provide services or volunteer or even just network with the pilots and they usually provide food and beverages and some sort of networking party. Um, it's simple Google Air Race Classic and you can see the volunteer opportunities and ways to get involved every year. That's great and you were doing some fundraising for that is that still going on also? Yes, yes we're really close we're super close to getting our um, amount that we need but we're, we still are about $600 short. Okay, and how can people help help make that happen for you? Um, you know, the best way would probably be to either email me or to get in touch with me somehow. Um, my an email address would be Gatlin Tanya T A N Y A at Yahoo dot com. Okay. Great, and uh, you're also, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you're working with a charitable organization with that as well. Is that right? Um, not specifically for the Air Race Classic. Okay. I work with a lot of charitable organizations, including Civil Air Patrol, which is one organization that wasn't mentioned. It's a fabulous opportunity for teenagers and students pre-high, well, pre-college, pre-college age to get involved with aerospace and aviation education. It's so absolutely beneficial in the training and the leadership that it developed. Um, but I'm sorry for that quick little plug-in. But yes, but none that are specifically involved with air race. No, it it is a great organization. My brother-in-law had the opportunity to participate, and he got a, a lot out of it at the time. So um, I think it's always great when when we can talk about different opportunities uh, for people to get involved with aviation, aerospace, or, or space exploration. Um, which kind of brings us up to our our last question there, Adam. <laughs> oh, you're gonna give it back to me now? Okay. I know you like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, Troy has a habit of um, taking over the interview and just running with it. So I just <laughs> have to wait until he's done talking, and then it's my turn again. So uh, I, we appreciate your apology for the shameless plug, but we do not accept it because we're all about shameless plugs. Um, <laughs> those are very important, especially in the nonprofit world. So, 
Space United, Space United, Space United, and then uh, go help Tanya with all her stuff too. Um, so m moving forward um, in, in the industry, we talked about um, a lot of the opportunities uh, that students have and, and young people, um, uh, maybe outside of like a high school or a college setting, um, and what they can do to get involved already. Um, but we always like to, to get the opinions of our guests um, and our audience on, on what else could be done, what, what's next. Um, so is there anything that uh, you've seen that seems to be a gap in the, the system or a gap in the opportunities or, um, or just something that uh, you would like uh, to see that's building on the foundation that's already built by the programs that are in place? Um, Adam, there are definitely the system, but they're rapidly being resolved. And um, I'll, I'll try and keep this short. I'm reading a book right now that's entitled From Jenny's to Jess. And I know many people have already used this analogy. But the book that I'm reading talks about the history of the airmail system and how that progressed into airliners and how from the early 1900s we now have the aviation industry we all know it today. And how comparable that is to the private and commercial space industry as everything is being pitched around. In the early 1920s, prior to the Kelly Act, all of our airmail was originally flown by the Army and then started being privatized out to commercial companies and larger routes, which were expanded and consolidated under Captain Listener into the major air carriers that we have today. And regulation and the FAA hadn't even been thought of yet. And I see it with trying to meld aviation and aerospace, the regulation, the airspace, but it's happening quickly. We have so much technology on our side. And so to answer your question, I would suggest that people get involved in venues that are age appropriate to them whether that be junior high and high school, maybe look out, search out Civil Air Patrol or things like Space United or different, you know, the Space Symposium on days where they can come and children can come. At college levels, get involved with different student groups, um, Commercial Space Flight Federation, STK, whatever it be, because we all know the power of networking. And when you go out to the airport or when you get involved with various groups and meet different the networking and the connections that can come out of this are unlimited, literally unlimited. Well, that's a great um, kind of call to action, and, and it's a great perspective. Um, uh, and I like the analogy. I mean, uh, people have talked around the issue, but uh, it seems like a lot of times the technology drives the, um, the governmental regulation. And so, uh, like you mentioned, we're, we're getting pretty close with the um, technology if we're not already there and so um, now we uh, need the uh, regulation but to your other point we also need a generation of, of kids and students and young people um, to drive that change I mean if um, if people aren't interested in space and don't uh, drive that industry forward then uh, it's going to at least have a, um, a delay in it if not um, kind of falling through the cracks uh, for in the next generation. So it's it's definitely up to us to to keep it going. Um, yes. Well, well, thank you for all your thoughts on that. Um, we have about five minutes left for questions, but Troy, did you have any last things that you wanted to ask or mention to Tanya? And and maybe you could keep it to a couple minutes this time. <laughs> no, I just wanted to thank Tanya for coming on and and talking with us and uh, helping to in encourage people to explore space and to, uh, to, to put themselves out there. I, I think a lot of times uh, people think that space is unattainable or, or you know, aerospace is unattainable, and, and it's not. It, it really is approachable, and there's lots of ways that you can get involved that, that don't require you to become a pilot tomorrow or an astronaut tomorrow, um, and there's lots of ways to help out uh, if you're not inclined in, in math or the sciences, and, and so it, it's great to to talk to um, lots of different people and get ideas on, on how people can get involved and appreciate you taking some time to, uh, to join us here today. No, no problem. Thank you. All right, we're going to have Tanya hang out for a few minutes to answer any questions that we have come in. Um, but we always like to flip the script around here at Space United 
and uh, ask you guys some questions to put you on the spot. And, of course, by you, we mean our uh, loving audience out there. Um, as we have talked about in the past, uh, we love it when you tune in online uh, live uh, through our Google Plus Hangout. Uh, but we also know that a lot of you catch um, our program via uh, our YouTube video um, as well as um, our audio podcast, and we have those available both on iTunes and Stitcher, uh, depending on what you prefer. So check those out. Um, I mentioned that because as you uh, watch or listen to the podcast throughout the week, um, feel free to uh, submit questions via um, ha uh, Twitter using the hashtag Space United. Um, but if you're here live with us right now, as some of you are, um, you can submit your questions either on the uh, page with the live broadcast or using this handy-dandy uh, Q&A button um, up in the top right of the video screen as well. So um, that's for your questions, but going back to our questions, um, we're going to pose similar questions to the ones that we asked Tanya um, and just running through them real quick. Uh, what degree do you think is best for exploring space? Um, are you more a traditional person that um, you want an aerospace engineering degree or um, something uh, a little bit more non-traditional? Give us uh, your thoughts and, and why you think that's the, the best way to go. Um, and maybe it can be involved with your story. I mean, what are you going after or what have you achieved and, and how has that helped you uh, move forward in the space industry? Um, the second, uh, how did the or how did you, rather, get involved with space exploration? So as we've mentioned, even if you haven't gotten involved yet, there are a lot of really easy ways to do that. And so um, this might not apply to you right now this second, but if you take some time later today or during the week and uh, explore one of these options, whether it's the SDK free trial um, or it's some of these other events and things that you can um, do or maybe ordering an Explorer Lab from Space United, um, uh, there are a lot of ways that you can answer this question, um, like I said, uh, with a quick turnaround. And then uh, finally, um, what opportunities would you like to see in the future? We, uh, we have a lot of things out there now. Uh, we're always looking for things to improve uh, the industry overall, whether it's through our organization, Space United, or some of the others that we've mentioned throughout the broadcast today. Uh, so let us know what you think. Again, uh, that's uh, hashtag Space United on Twitter anytime, and we'll get back to those as you ask them. Um, or right now, you can uh, put a comment on the uh, Hangout page or use the Q&A button uh, to submit it directly to us. Uh, so with that, we're going to uh, address a couple questions. Uh, first up, um, from, I believe it's Moan or Mon uh, in Indiana. Um, I only know that because she mentioned it in her question. Um, but her question is, how do you get kids involved um, living in Indiana? So uh, I think the um, imp implication may be that Indiana isn't exactly the hotbed of aerospace engineering, which I can understand considering I grew up in Illinois myself nearby. But uh, there's still plenty of, out there to do. We mentioned some of the online tools that you have that you can obviously access from anywhere. Um, but I would also recommend um, a planetarium uh, nearby. Uh, maybe you have one that is designed to be open to the public, or uh, if not, there are a lot of universities that have planetariums that might not have as much marketing behind them, so you might not be aware of them. Excuse me. Um, but they're available if you ask. Um, so for instance, uh, I know that the University of uh, Indiana is in Bloomington, so if you're anywhere nearby there, um, maybe check out uh, their astronomy department and see if you can get into a planetarium there. Uh, or if you're in northern Indiana, um, you might check out Notre Dame or one of the many schools in Chicago if you're uh, nearby to Chicago. So I would check that out. Um, also, science museums are a great place to go. Um, and just uh, laying out in your backyard, uh, maybe go to a particularly rural area, of which there are plenty in the Midwest, um, and uh, get away from some light pollution and uh, check out the stars. Um, there's also the added ability of technology these days uh, with smartphones and tablets and um, those sorts of things with apps that allow you to quickly um, identify uh, whatever you're looking at, so what, whether it's a specific star or a constellation or even um, planets uh, at certain times of the year. 
So I would uh, check those out and, and incorporate those into um, that trip. Um, but Troy, do you have any other ideas off the top of your head? You know, I think uh, if you just look um, you know, it, you're saying in Indiana, what what are the opportunities? Um, you know, our astronauts have come from from all over the world, and a lot of astronauts have come from Indiana. So if you think, oh, I'm I'm growing up in Indiana, there, there's not opportunities here. There's a lot of opportunities there, and there's a lot of people that have come from your state, including like Gus Grissom, uh, that you know, we're, we're able to uh, make it all the way into space. So uh, don't think because you live in some small town somewhere in Nowheresville that that precludes you from getting involved. There's lots of ways to get involved. All right. Uh, Troy, do you have any questions on the Twitter? I don't see any on the Twitter. It looks like we might be getting a few uh, on Google Plus here, but uh, having an issue finding those. The system is down. <laughs> Um, I don't see any more on the Google Plus Hangout page. Okay, yeah, I got several emails that there were comments, but um, like notifications, but internet, who knows how it works. So are, are we good, or do you have any more on the email? I think we're good. Okay. The internet is a little confusing to Troy sometimes, even though he does web design. <laughs> when you get so deep into the, the monster... Uh, you just don't know which way is up. Um, so we'll let him go fight that out on his own, um, and we'll uh, respect everyone's time and, and keep it uh, as close to on time as we can today. Thanks, everyone, uh, for tuning in. Thank you uh, to our guest, Tanya Gatlin, as well as um, to Troy, my uh, co-host and executive director and boss, um, who I should probably respect a little bit more, especially on the air. Um, and uh, all of you, like I said, you make this happen. Um, continue to submit questions and answers throughout the week, and uh, we will see you next week. Oh, wow, that was a little bit of a voice crack. I wasn't anticipating that. Um, so thanks again, and keep exploring for good, uh, and we will see you next Tuesday. Bye. <laughs>